Block Talk Radio. Am I live on Block Talk Radio? You are live. Hey, I'm live right here. This is Trooper Joe from Archangel. I return the chivalry on Block Talk Radio. That's how my girl says it, honey. <laughs> I don't know where that girl's from. I think she's probably from Australia or something, but something like that. But I, I love her voice the way she say Block Talk Radio. And for everybody else, you can catch me on Facebook Live, and I'll be on right there. Today, I'm going to be talking some more on um, Black History Month, because I really haven't been seeing a lot going on about Black History Month, you know? It's like everybody forgot about it. They're just focusing on, on Donald Trump and his crazy brood of, he got a, he got a gang of retards, I guess. I don't know what those guys are doing, you know? They're just having a good time for themselves at the expense of the United States of America. I'm here with Will. Uh, Troop. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm the Archangel of Return to Chivalry. Uh, Troop, Michael Flynn, his uh, defense secretary, uh, he just resigned yesterday because he was allegedly, well, because he had confessed to Donald Trump that he was speaking to Russia before Donald Trump's administration took over. And he was letting Donald, he was letting Russia know don't worry about the sanctions that Ob the Obama administration are putting on you. Trump will take care of those when he comes back. Mm. And thus, he, they found out about it. I guess they have recordings of it now. Mm. So he got caught red-handed, and they, he subsequently was forced to resign. Yeah, people, people, the world isn't as simple as you're trying to make it. The politics that's out there, you, we, we're not privy to that information. This little bit of make-believe stuff like that with Russia and the United States and China and everything's revolving around some make-believe, oh, you got to do the right thing. It's a, you know, they should do the right thing, but they're not going to get an Archangel card, which should be coming out in about a month, <laughs> and a certificate suitable for hanging. But the, 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 the world is run by money. It's run by power. The money is only the measure of how much power you got in most places. Now nah, that's all they use the money for. They don't even use it to spend anymore. You know, it's just there. They just do that. It's run by power, and we're never really gonna know what kind of deals that all these powerful countries make with one another. We're not gonna know what. what like we got Netanyahu right here, right now in this in this country with Trump, and at the same time, he's in this country with Trump, they're investigating him for doing stupid things over in Israel. His own Israeli police have him on investigation for, take, for allegedly taking bribes and stuff like that. Most people don't know about that, <laughs> you know? They don't know these things, so. That's why I think Trump, Trump, I think people, we need to start really getting a, a handle on what's going on. You know, so that we can really understand just where the world sits today, and not so much where the world sits, where do I sit in the world? That's the biggest part about the thing. And that takes courage. Yes, it does, on your part, and we will be talking about courage today. But first, we're going to talk about the uh, African-American um, month. What do you call it? Black, Black History, History Month. Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about this here. Now what I'm gonna talk to you about is this is is this guy wrote insights and he incited class warfare down in the South. His name is Hilton R. Helper, white guy. That's right, he was a white guy, 1857. And this here was his his um and it, and it became the abolitionist movement anyways, you know, part of the abolitionist movement. This is the stuff that he talked about. Let me give you a little back a little uh, backstory on him. 1857, Hinton R. Helper, a non-slaveholder from North Carolina, published the uh, Impending Crisis, a combination diatribe and satirical analysis proving slavery in the cause of all is he claimed and this is what what became so powerful in everything that slavery was was the cause of all shame poverty ignorance tyranny and imbibility of the south and i guess that's like cutting off from the mother country 
from the mother lady. <laughs> but this is what his claim was and everything. And he, he put together this charter. And I'm going to read the charter. There's 11 steps in the charter. And I'm going to, leave, I'm going to read this charter. And, and if people want to comment on the charter, they can, they can call in at um, the numbers. I don't know the numbers. The number to call <laughs> in to uh, Archangel and Return to Chivalry is area code 323-870-4069. Again, that is 323-870-4069. Yeah, now let me read this to you, folks. All right. Inscribed on the banner, which we heal with unfurled to the world with the full and fixed determination to stand by it or die by it. Remember, this is a white non-slave-holding person in North Carolina who's totally against slavery. He sees slavery as the thing that brings shame, poverty, ignorance, tyranny, and cuts the biblical cord in the South from the rest of the country. All right? So keep that in mind while we're reading this. Unless one of the more virtuous efficiencies shall be presented, are the models which in substance embody the principles as we conceive that should be governing us in our patriotic warfare against the most subtle and insidious foe that ever menaced the inalienable rights and liberty and dearest interest of America. And that's slavery. That's what he's talking about. That we talk, he, he, he makes slavery, it's a war, it's a patriotic war against the most subtle and insidious foe that ever menaced the inalienable rights and liberties and dearest interest of America. I'm sure he only had the interest of the white people down in the north, south, east, and west, but it, <clears throat> he knew slavery was the thing that was tearing apart and killing the country and bringing it shame. So here's what this, his charter was talking about. One, he said, through organized and independent paper, uh, political action on the part of the non self slave-holding whites, I'm having a hard time reading this, of the South. That's his first step. Two, ineligibility of slaveholders ne uh, never another vote to the trafficking in human flesh. So to kill slave, nobody who's not a slaveholder, if you're not a slaveholder, if you're just a white person down in the South, because blacks didn't vote then, it's 1857. Now, there's never going to be another vote for trafficking in human human uh, flesh, which would be slave. You got, well, I ain't going to go into the history. All right, number three, no cooperation with slaveholders in politics, no fellowship with them in religion, no affiliation with them in society. He was separating out all the slaveholders as the root cause of all the shame and hardships and everything else that was befalling the self. All right, number four, no patronage, patronage of slaveholding merchants, don't go to their stores, no guest ship in slave holding hotels. You can't go to their hotels. No fees to slave holding lawyers. No employment of slave holding physicians. No audience to slave holding persons. And, and let me just give a clarity on hotels because I'm sure a lot of people might think, well, what do you mean by hotels? Back then in those days like that, hotels were, weren't used as the way they use today. You know, hotels, people used to go to the hotel in the morning, read the paper, get breakfast and everything. They didn't live there in the night. They didn't have a room. That's just where they went. There were dinners in hotels. There were theaters in hotels. Hotels was a kind of a societal place to be seen, you know? And that's right, no guest ship in, in slave, slave waiting hotels. Now, number five. No recognition of pro-slavery men except as ruffians, outlaws, and criminals. I mean, my man called them right up in their face what they're all about. <laughs> he, he, he's not pulling any punches on, on, on this slavery thing and, the, and people that are slaveholders. 
men, and you know, he's talking white directly to the white faces. These are nothing but white faces talking back and forth at each other. <laughs> you know? I say, number six, abrupt disconnecting, discontinuance of subscriptions to pro slavery newspapers. Yes, they can't buy their newspapers anymore. Yeah. Number seven, the greatest possible encouragement to free white labor. Now, he wanted to free white labor, too, because white labor, it, it seemed like what he mean by free white labor was that a lot of people, a lot of whites, poor whites and stuff, couldn't find work because a lot of the work was done during that time was labor. You know, it was, it was hard work. It was something you had to do with your hands. And the slave was taking that. Yeah? They, they, the slaveholder had his slave doing that, so the poor white people, they didn't have any job. Number eight, no more hiring of slaves by non-slaveholders. So, you know, the, the non-slaveholder can't go over and talk to his uncle or cousin or brother who might own some slaves and say, can I hire some of your slaves out to do the, bring in the cotton, bring in the crops or whatever they want to hire them out for to build a barn or something like that. No more of that. No more of that. You know, because he, he was actually about trying to increase the improvement of, of the white people in, in the South anyways and stuff. And he knew that to do that, he had to eliminate slavery. You know, I don't think the man was sitting out there with the uh, thing of, I'm going to eliminate slavery. No, I think he was sitting out there to increase the appearance of white people and give them a better life. But in doing that, he knew he had to eliminate slavery. So these are the things that he had to, he had to eliminate. <clears throat> right? Number nine, immediate death of slavery. See? Bang. No more of it. Or if not immediate, unqualified prescriptions of the advocates at bed. Boy, I'm bad at reading during the period of this extinction. All right. So he, the main, the main premise is the immediate death of slavery. That's what he was calling for. The immediate death of slavery. Not no real. Oh, well, we'll keep a little bit of it. Uh, we'll just chop off a foot. No, no. We're going to kill it. We're going to take it and we're going to grease our wheels of our, of our wagons with it. And then number 10, a tax. Now, this is where he's hurting the slave owners. A tax of $60 on every slaveholder for each and every Negro in his possession at the present time or at any intermediate time between now, 1857, and the 4th of July, 1863. Said money to be applied to the transportation of blacks to Lib Liberia, to their colonialized colonialization in Central and South America, or to a comfortable settlement within the boundaries of the United States. So he wanted to, he just didn't want to kill slavery by eliminating, eliminating from the South. He wanted to get all the blacks out of the South too, so that the whites could have a, a better hand at trying to make money doing the, the labor's jobs that the, the slaves were doing. Now, this 1857, so that was a good plan. That was a good plan for him, you know. And right there, blacks to Liberia. Send them back to Africa, or send them to Central and South America, or send them up north. That's the comfortable settlements with the boundaries of the United States. Right? And number 11, the last one, any additional tax, an additional tax of $40 per annum to be levied annually on every slaveholder for each and every Negro found in his possession after the 4th of July, 1863, said money to be paid into the hands of the Negro so held in slavery or in cases of death to his next of kin and to be used by them at their own option. So <clears throat> he really, really, truly wanted to get them blacks out of there. So you still here in 1863, I'm going to... I'm going to put the, uh, this here tax on that white guy who's who's 
thinking he's still owning you, and we give you the money so you can get out of there. Kind of like the 40 acres and a mule. This is, you know, this was $40. You know, which was a good amount of money back in that time. Right? So <clears throat> that's a little bit more about some of the black black history as I and I'm picking out these things and this is from Slavery Attack, the Abolitionist Crusade. This is a book by John John T. Thomas and it was written way back in the days before printing presses. No. <laughs> it is way back in the in the early days. But you get you can see that you know, really, what, what's the problem with, with a lot of the stuff that even is coming on today? A lot of African Americans are still using, using. And I think they got it more from the Jewish people and stuff. The Jewish like to use the Holocaust as, as one of their major focal points to bring about some kind of, some kind of I don't know if it's sympathy, empathy, or whatever it might be, some kind of attention seeking or some kind of uh, validation or justification for something. You know, and they like to do that. And, and, and they've been doing that for quite a while. And the blacks are following suit and doing the same thing with slavery. And, and they like, you know, slavery without a doubt. Because remember last week we talked about the maiming and the eyes being knocked out and, you know, it was, I mean, scarring on the back, stuff that you don't even think about. You think about, yeah, they were whipped. But you don't think about the severity of the whip. How do you whip to get your eye knocked out? That's some kind of whipping, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, chopping your toes off and stuff. We only saw that in roots, you know, and we make jokes out of it now, you know, of, you know, stuff like that. But this was real. This was the life. This was the, This was how things were. And and uh, this guy here, you know, he. He saw that he lived in the South. And remember, it was an agrarian society. We had just, we had even, we haven't even in this country at that time really turned the corner to become an industrial society. We were still agrarian. We were farmers. You know, we were hunter, farmers, all these things, all labor intensive type of things. The railroad hadn't been, the westward expansion hadn't taken place yet. So the railroad hadn't stretched across the country. We were still floating things down the Mississippi and the Missouri out into the Gulf, you know, and, and the East Coast was still a huge, a huge mecca for commerce because it had access to the Atlantic Ocean, you know, that whole coastline. The, the West Coast, nobody went to the Pacific because they said, well, why are you going that way? It's too long. We didn't have the Panama Canal and stuff like that during that time. So you, you, you can see that it was important, it was important for the South and, and for this country to have some kind of um, wage labor because we were agrarian. We were selling our products that we made from the land. And, you know, the, the product don't care who gets it. <laughs> so if it's a black hand that's reaching the cotton or a white hand, it doesn't care. Put it in the bag, the cotton spot. You know? But in, in the South there, huge amount of poverty going on that wasn't mentioned, you know. Huge amount, of, huge amount of poverty that was going on that was that was really fueling the um, the, the the whites' plight uh, against the North because they didn't have that huge amount of poverty up in the North. The North had poverty because it wasn't getting the product. It, you know, it would have had immense poverty if it didn't have slavery to bring the product up to ship it out. You know, but it did. But it wasn't it wasn't relying on on. Um, it wasn't relying on, on hands to do the work, you know. It, it, it didn't need that. They were more academic up there. They thought they were intelligent and smart. They were all, you know, walking around like they do now. You know, I'm smart. Look at me. I can go in this fancy uh, restaurant and sit down and spend this money I don't have and <laughs> talk about all these big scholastic things. They were fashioning themselves after the Greeks. But that's a that's a different thing. So that's a little bit I wanted to talk about for African American history. And next week I'm gonna talk a little bit more, but we're gonna go into the Reconstruction a little bit more. That's the Reconstruction period for most people. That's the period that's where the Great Migration up to the north and everything. It was only like an eleven year span, but that eleven year span with the freeing of the slaves changed the whole face of this country. 
and we're going to talk about the importance of the African American in changing the face of this country. Now, it, it, this country would not be this country if it weren't for the African American, it, without a doubt. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. Nobody wants to say it because it, 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 if you say it, it's like, well, you know, how are you going to prove it? You can get this book <laughs> if you want to. It's right there. The information's out there, folks. All you got to do is want to go get it. But it's out there. But we're going to um, throw in a commercial, a couple of little commercials, I think, and then we're going to go into courage. That's more they can offer you. MSPCC, Elliott CHS. Located at 355 Chandler Street in Worcester, 01602, phone number 508-753-2967. I can go this way. Yeah, I want to shout out the um, World's Gym up there behind the Glendale Mall, or in the Glendale Mall. This is a gym where you can go and you can actually have a workout and train with other people that have like minds that you have, there's, it's not a uh, one of those go in there and keep your mouth shut and it's a judgment free type of thing. No, it's like go in there and train next to people that are training for high speed events that are coming up, bodybuilders, ultimate athletes, professional football players, professional all kinds of athletes, all kinds of people that have been there, just regular old people like me. Just anybody who wants to go there, go to um, the World's Gym at the Glendale Mall. All right, now we're going back. I'm going to talk about courage. Because I'm back. And this is Trooper Joe talking to you about courage. Courage, what is it? All right. It, it is one of those things that makes us who we are. That's an important fact to know about courage. Courage makes you who you are. You know, <clears throat> you can have... Three different kind of coverages, you know. You can have you can well you can have physical coverage and mental coverage, you know. Physical coverage as an adventurous, you know, that's somebody who takes risks. You know. You, and it's not just taking risks in, in, in paragliding off of the top of a big building, you know, it's taking risks in business, it's taking risks in romance. It's taking risks a lot of people I seen them in, in the stores yesterday, they were taking a risk getting those last minute flowers for those hunts. <laughs> so they're they're pretty adventurous too. Yeah, you know, so that that that's that's one one facet of the physical courage, you know, it's an adventure. Another one is in in our leadership, you know. It produces greatness in others, you know. That's an important courage type of thing to do. It's also a risk to produce greatness in another in the other person. Because if you can have you, if you're just a great person in your organization and stuff, then you're all by yourself. You know, you have nothing to bounce your creative ideas off of. You can hire other people. You can say, "Well, I'm gonna hire these people to come in here, and they're gonna um, do this here." They're not gonna have the same kind of um, things that you're looking for. They won't. That's why it, it, it's a physical kind of coverage. It's a risk type of coverage to, to produce a leader in, in, your, in your own field, you know, in others. So to produce a leader in others, you got an advocacy. you got a, an, um, somebody that you can talk to. you got somebody that you can actually sit down and think about because the like minds will be thinking together. But you would have created that leader. And then there's the individual Creating lead, the, the courage to be you is the most important courage that, that, that really surpasses all the other courages. You can't do any of the other things without having enough courage to be you. And we seem to be locked into a society in this time where people don't want to be themselves. People are, I don't know if it's fear. I don't even know if it's true. I could be just seeing this here from... From another dimension, I don't know. Sometimes <laughs> I think I do, but people seem today not wanting to be themselves. They want to be entertained, and they want to have happiness and freedom and stuff. <clears throat> but you know, it, they don't want to be them. It's like it. It. it it's kind of like well, you know, they, they might have said, "I always wanted to be a physicist," you know, but they don't have the courage to go be the physicist. Or I always wanted to be a doctor, 
but they don't have the courage to go be a doctor or an entrepreneur. They're lacking within themselves to go and do that because they don't have their own individual strengths out there to be able to do that. They let fear get in there and take them over. And courage and fear kind of live together in the same place, but they don't really get along all that well. And then, then we have what you call mental courage. And then we have this, what you call survivors. That's someone who's not going to quit. Yeah. The, 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 survivor, very, the survival attitude is very important in courage for the individual. It's like, I, I got this. I'm not quitting. I can do this. This is hard. This really stinks. And this is what I need to do to get to where I want to be. I'm not stopping now. I'm just going to keep right on keeping on. And we, we have seen the loss that mentality. We've seen the lost that idea that we we can do that. It's not that hard for us to do. It's hard for an animal to do. Yeah, we look at animals and say, look at that. You know, look how graceful that animal moves through the woods. It's an animal. You know, I wish I could do that. You can. You know, you ain't gonna run like an animal. You ain't got four legs. <laughs> you know, you only got two. Even if it's a two-legged animal, you still ain't gonna run like an animal. You know, right. This, this is a, a survival, we, you don't quit, you know? And we, we don't have instincts, you know? We don't work on instincts, we work on reason. And that's the other mental thing, reason. As, as a person, we have the ability to think it out. We have the ability to plan our plan. We have the ability to, to plan for the future and plan all the things that's going to take us to that future. And that's powerful. And, but without the individual courage, we're, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. We're going we're to shy away from that. This is where archangels are important. Archangels, they're, they're just like everybody else, you know, except that they have courage to, to be themselves. It takes a lot of courage to go ahead and help somebody. You know, it takes a lot of courage to do the right thing. You know, it, 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 it takes a lot of courage to... Do the right thing within yourself. That that's what I'm, that, the main premise of this here is taking the courage to <clears> develop <throat> yourself. And one of the things you have to start the first place you have to start is don't quit. Cause a lot of people come out there. Not I shouldn't say a lot of people. You know, people of today come out there and they have great ideas. And and it, when they first start out with their ideas, they were they're all on fire. You know, they, 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 oh, this is going to be so great. Everything's going to be so good. They got all these things, and then they hit their first little bump in the road. It ain't a big bump. It's a little bump. All of a sudden, they turn that, what was that phrase? Oh, turn a mount, uh, mountain from a molehill or something. Turn like a molehill into a mountain. Yeah, yeah, that's what they do. It, it, it's like, boom, and it's a little lump. It ain't big, it's just a little lump. You don't stub your toe. You know, and they quit. Yeah. Uh, true. I think that I, I just, I, the proper saying, just to be clear, is you make a mountain out of a molehill. Yeah. That's yeah. the proper saying. Of make, it. make a mountain out of a molehill. It wasn't, nothing, it wasn't anything there. Yeah, but you quit. And why did you quit? Because you were looking to quit in the first place. You didn't have the courage to stay your plan. You had the big plan. Yeah, you had this big grandiose picture that's going, oh, it's huge. It umbrellas the world. It's almost as big as Archangel of a church of chivalry, <laughs> which you can see on the shirt. But it takes, you know, you know, you, you don't have the courage to follow it through. Everything isn't going to run as smooth as you want it to run. And, and for me, I just, a little bit for me right now, for, for me, I don't want it to run smooth. I don't want I don't want my program Archangel of Return to Chivalry to have no bumps. Then I don't learn anything. You know? And if I'm not learning anything, then I can't come on this radio and talk to all my wonderful listeners out there and and say, hey, I learned this. You know, and they can call in, soon be able to write in to me and everything and tell me about what they learned so I can tell the rest of the people what we learned and we start to 
we start to uh, force multiply. Yeah, I'm a soldier. That's what. <laughs> so force multiply is what we know. And and then this is how the, the uh, movement grows. And it's not a movement per se. It's it's a return to chivalry. It's a return to something that everybody wants to do in the first place. Yeah, because you get all the rewards and the privileges out of doing these things. And those rewards and privileges actually come with a lot of love and good feeling and a lot of entertainment. But you can't get there if you quit. You can't do it. It won't be done. And you can't get there if you're not going to have the courage to stand and say, Who am I? This is a hard thing for people to answer this question. If you ask somebody, ask your loved one sitting right beside you right now, and ask them, you know, tell them who you are. You know, that's all you got to do. Maybe you want to do that tonight <clears throat> instead of watching The Simpsons. Yeah, you might, you might want to, you can watch The Simpsons if you want to. There's no football, so <laughs> you got to watch something. So you might as well watch The Simpsons. Yeah. And, but to just, to, or just by yourself, reflect in a mirror by yourself, or go out for a walk and reflect on yourself or anything. Just sit in a comfortable chair reflecting on yourself. Who am I? You know, why am I here? What am I doing? You know, what's my fears? What's my likes? You know, and why am I scared of, of success? Why, why am I scared to be somebody that's successful? Because that seems to be where you're going to end up. Because without courage, you're going to always quit. And without courage, you're not going to be able to answer those questions of who I am. So you're not going to know yourself. So, you know, it, and then the other things you can't do anyways. You won't be able to take risks. You won't be able to develop leaders. You won't be able to do any of those other things that take, that take coverage. You'll just, you just be going around in a circle, you know, having great epiphanies, <laughs> you know, and you'll have a lot of, a lot of epiphany um, blocks and stuff. You build houses out of epiphany blocks. <laughs> Yeah, they're by Legos. You can create your own epiphany blocks because you'll have so many of them, but they'll never come to, to any kind of uh, finished product because you won't have the coverage to know who you are. And that, and that's that that's that's scary. Actually, I find that to be one of the scariest things on the planet. I find it to be one of the one of the things that cause our angel to. To, to be a return to chivalry because people forgot who they are. You know, society started to move on. People used to know who they were. You know, when societies were simple, you know what you, who you were within your, your, your I'm going to call it a tribal environment and stuff. You might have been the great deer hunter. Or you might have been the great rabbit hunter. Or you might have been the great, the great house builder. But you knew who you were. You know, and if you didn't want to be the great deer hunter, you could learn how to be the great rabbit hunter or the great house builder. You know, it was easy. Everybody was ready to share and, and reciprocate back and forth like that. And it was all for, for, for one thing, survival. We don't have that now, right? So there's no courage really to, to be manifested in people because you don't have to have to be the great deer hunter. You know, you can be the great, what well, we have here in Worcester that I go to is Shaw's. Or <laughs> you could be the great Shaw shopper, you know. <laughs> I'll maneuver that, that carriage around all them little old ladies that are taking their time, buying their things. And <laughs> oh, you got to go around them. Or you really know how to work the aisles. I mean, this takes skill. But a lot of people can't do that. They detest going shopping. I don't want to go shopping too hard and everything. You know, that's where they don't even know themselves. You can make a game out of going shopping. You know what you want. You buy the same thing all the time. You know, you can go in there. You know the exact same time you go in there. You know the exact same people that you're going to see in there because you're doing it all the time. It's like there's nothing new when you're going into that store. At least, at least 20 out of out of 21 times it's going to be the same routine with the same people and you're going in and you're going to go. I used to, way back in the day, I used to go to stop and shop in Brookline. I lived in, in, in um, um, Mission, Mission Park. And I used to go shopping on Sunday morning when the store opened up. 
And that's when I used to do the shopping and stuff like that. I go to the store. The only other person in there was, was with me was Mike Dukakis. And it was funny that we had the same habits. Mm -hmm. You know, we never spoke. Just smile, kind of a nod. He do mm, going like this. I go mm, going like that. I do just where everything was. <laughs> just going through the same kind of robotic kind of thing out the door on Sunday. Nobody in the way. That was good for me for my shopping. That was my that was my food shopping time. But I, I could have if I had a remote control, just turn on the the cot. It could have went and banged into things and knocked them off just the way I was doing it anyway. So <laughs> it was all a routine. But how I get off track, I don't know. <laughs> let's get let's get back off track a little bit here. Another reason why why people it lack in coverage to, to be themselves is anxiety. Mental stresses. We love mental stresses. We love to have them. We gotta have them. We gotta have we make them up you know <laughs> we don't care we got a mental stress but oh i'm so depressed why are you depressed because my potato chip bag is empty well go buy another potato chip bag i shouldn't really eat potato chips <laughs> this is so stressful <laughs> Buy the chips. If you want the chips, if you're going, if you're going to have an anxiety attack about not having the chips, buy the chips. But at least make it a, a footnote in your own mind. I like potato chips. So when you're thinking about who you are, what your likes and dislikes are, at least there's one point that you can put your finger right on. I like potato chips. You know? Or I like ice cream. Or I like chicken. Or I like steak. Or I like whatever it is that you like. Don't get anxious about it that it's not there. But that's what we do because we developed a habit. You know, we developed this habit, but this habit has no real, real worth in it, you know. Life's not going to end because you don't have that bag of potato chips, but life might end if you allow the anxiety and stress to overcome you because you don't have a bag of potato chips. And this is real stuff, folks. I, I'm not making this part up. This is real stuff. There are real people out there who go into serious anxiety. Not because they don't have food. It's because they don't have the potato chips. No, they forgot to get the potato chips. How am I going to make it through the night? I don't have a dessert. Ah, oh, well... What's that? Oh, that's supper. What is it? Yeah, I got a piece of steak. I got potatoes. I got some greens here and stuff like that. Ah, oh, look at this. I got this, this nice. Some people like to have it with wine or whatever they libation that they want, tonic or water or whatever it is that they want. But then here comes the stress after that. Why? They don't have the potato chips. <laughs> they forgot to get the potato The whole meal's ruined. <laughs> it's a bad meal. They don't have any potato chips. Well... But they weather it. They weather it. Some people are stronger than others, and they were, they were able to get through and weather this. Year. And that takes courage. That takes courage to stand up to those stressful moments that you yourself brought on yourself because you, you didn't know yourself because you didn't have courage. See, anxiety and and the uh, elimination of anxiety is only courage. That's all it is. You're taking a courage. You're taking a risk. Can I make it through the night without my potato chips? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much, <laughs> pretty much. You might even grow a habit of not wanting potato chips, you know, but that's, that's something else. But it takes courage to meet that, 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 that stressful mental stress right there in the face on. You, you and the lack of chips coming at each other just like two big ramming goats on the side of about bagged heads, you know. You're just coming at each other and one of you are going to win. And it's really sad that in this society and in this time, the winner seems to be the anxiety of not having potato chips. That's pretty sad. You don't have to get anxious because you don't have potato chips. But we will. We will. Now, and, and, this, and, and that's because of complacency, too. Rather than taking the time to know who we are and find out what the things are that we like to do and, and things like that, we 
become complacent. We become like the habit of going shopping. You just go in, go around, come out. Same cashier, same place like that. Looking for the same. Well, actually, in some of the cashiers, you have to go into this cashier. It, not because it, it, it's the quicker line. It's because the cashier gave you good service and it gave you a smile and it made, made you feel special. Because you needed something to feel special about. Because that's what we need to have. Because if we're not feeling special, you know, then, then, then we need those chips, <laughs> you know, more than we really, really understand that we need those chips. So that's why even in the store, we go to, go to some of the people we see working the cashier, and it just makes you feel good for that little second and everything that you know the cashier said. Hi, and some of them give you a smile because you smiled at them. That's an infectious type of thing right there. All you got to do is smile at a cashier and just give them a little cough. Oh, is that new fingernails? No, I never noticed that before. If you're, if you're prefacing with, oh, I didn't notice that. Or you, or you leave it like that at the end. Pay a friend. You got to hold, you gotta, they'll put the card in for you. <laughs> or something like that. Is it, is it, if you know yourself and you know what you want, and you know that you're sincere in yourself, then these anxieties won't happen. And with these anxieties, you'll be able to not manipulate people. I know, that's kind of a harsh kind of thing. But to make people feel good, and and in making people feel good, you you reap the benefits even if you don't think so. But sometimes you can make people feel good and manipulate people. Too. I did it. I'm guilty of raising my hand. I didn't manipulate her, but I made her feel good. She was my, my teacher, yeah, and it, it was a class in public speaking, and I just happened to be out in Mexico, in uh, New Mexico, and, and I saw a, a talking stick. You know, what a talking stick is kind of like, the Indians have a talking stick. I think that they, they tried to copy the same kind of proceedings up here in the Northeast with the uh, peace circles and stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in an Indian culture, you have a peace circle. It's not a peace circle, it's a circle. This is how they communicate. Everybody's in a circle, and whoever has the talking stick has the floor. So there was a talking stick. So, oh, of course, because I had a midterm that I was, <laughs> I wasn't going to get to because I was in New Mexico. So I bought the talking stick and I presented it to the teacher. Oh, you know it worked. <laughs> It had to work. It was a public speaking class. How could it fail? You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> See, but this is this is where I knew me, and the teacher of the class knew me, and they knew that this was a sincere thing. I just happened to be fortuitous at that time that I was able to use it to get a, a little bit of extension on <laughs> on the midterm. You know, so but see, if you know yourself and you know people and you keep it in your heart and. I could have got anxious about, oh, man, I got the mentor. I could have ruled my whole time down there in New Mexico. You know, I could have had all kinds of anxiety about that, you know. But no, I just bought that talking stick. We'll let it see how it rolls. <laughs> so don't do that, folks. That's the, <laughs> you can if you want to, you know. Sometimes you get the merits for <laughs> in, in being an archangel in there. Yeah, and the marriage can be fun too. I'm all over the place with this, but it's just it's still about knowing yourself and the courage to be who you are. So sometimes you, you know you know you're going to get a demerit in some things, and you say I, I'm going to do it anyway because it's the right thing to do, even though it's just a little bit outside the rules, and I know it's going to have some ramifications, but I'm ready to take on this ramification because it's the right thing to do. And so you're taking that risk, you know. And it, there's there's a lot of people who take 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 that risk, and they take those demerits. West Point is famous for taking demerits. They got a place called the Walk of Shame in West Point, you know, where where they got a walk. They, you know, it's like a God post walking and stuff like that. But it's not in the garden anything. You're just walking, and it's called the Walk of Shame, so everybody knows that you're on the Walk of Shame. But no cadet goes through West Point without ever ending up <laughs> on the walk of shame. It's just not something that's done because in, in West Point, one of their major things is on coverage and knowing yourself and taking risks. And sometimes you have to take a risk in doing something. And, and, and you know that 
I can't get to this, but I'm going to get it the best if I can. Oh, man. They caught me. I got a demerit. You took the wrist. <laughs> you know, you got two little lint balls on your, your, <laughs> your uniform. All right. Two hours on the walk of shame, you know? <laughs> but you took the risk because you had to, you, you said, I ain't got time to give this an extra, a extra mm -hmm. roll. You know? <laughs> I got I to gotta get over here. So this, this is, this is, that takes courage, you know? That really does take courage. It sounds kind of funny, but it really does take a lot of courage because you could, anx you could be anxious about that and all that's going to do is waste time. <laughs> you could be, you could sit around and you can find all kinds of justification why this can't be done. Ah, and, and all these hemming and harvings and you can get all kinds of stressed out about this here on just an, uh, another lip roll, but you just don't have the time to get that thing done, you know. And so you, you just take the risk, take the hit, and you end up on the walk of shame. And that's all right. If you know yourself, it's all right to be on the walk of shame. Yeah? It, it, it's like everybody ends up on the walk of shame. Mm -hmm. in, in any form of life, any, everybody's going to be ending up on the walk of shame at some point in time. You know? It, not, it ain't big infractions. It's just little itty bitty things that, that come through life. But... A lot of people can't handle it because they don't know themselves, you know. And it takes real courage to know yourself. So, to, to be an archangel, one of the one of the main things is know yourself. You, you know what you can and cannot do. Some people want to rush in there and and help out and, and do this thing. I'm gonna tell one more story about my wife and 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 her, her father in the Haiti um, earthquake and. They're two doctors. Oh boy! And they got bitten by the the, the over compassion bug. <laughs> <laughs> it bit them square on the butt. Boom! Big bites in there and stuff. They ran down there and they and one got a friend. They gonna get them over there and stuff like that. And they're gonna help out because they 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 were just full of all this. I gotta get there and gotta help out and everything. But it wasn't. You know, it was for the right reason, but it wasn't any planned reason and stuff. And they took the risk. They took this risk because they were they was thinking, they they thought about themselves, right? But they didn't know themselves what they were thinking about, and they didn't know what the environment they were getting into. So they took a risk. So this was all archangel type of stuff that they were doing. Mm -hmm. it's, except except that that they didn't know the situation. So in taking a risk too, you gotta analyze and take time to analyze the situation. You know, you gotta you gotta take time to look at all the variables that might be fall. You just can't you just can't look at yourself from one little perspective like this in a narrow beam. It, it won't work. And that's what they did. You know, I put some power bars in their bag for them. Uh oh, that's probably my wife. <laughs> he yelled at me. So I, I gave her some power bars to get on down there because everybody else <laughs> was doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. They all rushed to Haiti. Haiti ain't about the size of a walnut. <laughs> and you got all these airplanes and all these people. They're all running into a place that is devastated by an earthquake. <laughs> it's like you can't even go to the bathroom. You gotta wait till somebody clears the area, gets the orders established and everything, then get in there. There's no supplies, none of that stuff. See that 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 that's where that's where having the the courage to know yourself and say, okay, step back. How am I, What am I gonna do when I get there? I'm gonna do this, this, and this, and this, cause I'm this, 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 and this. Yeah, that's true. But how are you going to do that? Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't know. So that's, that sets up a little anxiety. They had fun, though. And they got to help a few people and stuff like that. But it, 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 was, it was really a mess over there. And, and, and it's a very archangel type of thing to do. It was all about taking the risk and extending themselves to help somebody else. And that's that's what you're supposed to do. 
you know, as an archangel. But you got to know yourself and know what limitations you have and know your environment or what you're going into. So all you people that's going to potential archangels, and there's millions of you out there, because I don't want anybody just to, to go out there and start doing things for for people just because, yeah, I don't know if you ever saw that on Facebook, I think it happened now where the, the guy, he's a Jamaican guy driving the truck and everything, and this other guy had been running, and he, and he ran up to on a hill and stuff, and he's leaning on his Porsche, Oh, really stretching it out like and the guy he just having a good happy moment in his truck and he pulls out and he's he's gonna help the guy and he walks over there with his little his strut on and everything and he gets up there and they push the he pushes the Porsche over, <laughs> over the ledge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he didn't know the environment. He didn't know what was going on. He was taking in the moment about about being an archangel and go to help this guy, you know, go to show compassion with this guy, do a little bit, we're going to push this guy over the cliff because I know that's what you're doing. And it's like, no, the guy was stretching out <laughs> from doing his running on his push. <laughs> so, you know, you got to learn your environment or you can end up doing really silly things like that, which can come back and hurt you if you're in business, <laughs> especially business and politics, folks. You can, you can, uh, you can be talking to yourself just like that truck driver was. He was happy in the moment. He was the only one in the truck. So whatever he said to himself, that had to be real. You know, that guy needs some help pushing that car over there. I'm going to help him. You know, so if you're in business or you're doing something in, in regard like that, and you're full of archangel kind of being and you have all the coverage of your convictions and stuff, but you didn't, you take the time to assess the environment that you're getting into, or you didn't take the time to really understand just who you are and what you're doing it for and why you want to do it, that you will fail. And that's a, a sad part. And your failure might be something that's really traumatic. So, you know, you, you, you have to, you have to, you don't have to, but... It's best if you really take a look at yourself and see who you are. And that, like I said, that takes courage. Because once you start looking at yourself to find out who you are, you just might not be all that happy with yourself at the moment. But don't let that become anxiety, you know. Don't let that become distress. Let that become the, 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 the plan, the template that you're going to use. You're going to change it. It's like, you be honest with yourself. I don't like that. It ain't that I don't like me. I don't like that. I'm going to change that. How am I going to change that? You got to know your environment. You know? What, how am I going to change this thing that I don't like about me? Say you don't like about that you that you, I, you know, I don't, I don't like about me that sometimes I stutter a lot. And I use little words where I could use a bigger word just to, to do. I know other people do it backwards, but <laughs> I do it like that. And I talk on myself, but I practice. I have to practice on my speaking. I practice all the time my speaking. I practice my reading. I, I'm, I, I'm not satisfied with the way I present myself. Not whether other people are satisfied with the way I present myself. is I'm not satisfied with the way I present myself. So I know that, so I got my plan. I read out loud to myself. I read standing up. You know, I, I, I take a, a small little sentence and I elaborate on that sentence and everything so that I can practice talking and stuff. It's working, you know, but this is the stuff that I know myself, so I have to do this. Everybody has to really look within themselves, and then you have to have the courage to be able to change that, you know? Because if you don't have the courage to change who you are, then you're not even going to know who you are. But once you figure out who you are, it takes courage to change that. And then there's a risk that's associated with that courage, too. You change from that, I'm not having anxiety for not having those potato chips. I, <laughs> you know, there's a risk that you're going to have anxiety for not having those potato chips. And there's a, a real risk that comes with that. It ain't gonna last long. It's a, just like any other thing like that. But well, folks, I think I done rambled on about coverage a little bit more than I thought I was. 
I didn't get to all the points that I wanted to make, but that's all right. There's equations that go to coverage and stuff like that. Coverage times anxiety times persistence and patience and then leap will equal the alleviation of stress. We'll get to that next week. I think I'm going to come more in, in, in um, how to alleviate the stress through coverage, how to use coverage to make you into the you you want to be. And you can't be you unless you have the coverage to look at you and be what you want to be. Because if not, you'll just be satisfied with whatever makes other people say, oh, he's a nice guy, I like having him around, you know? And you don't like being that person. You know? And that, that's, that's what courage takes. And there's coverage in everything you can see. There's a movie that you can all can watch. Just watch the first part. Colin Powell only watches the first part. It's called The Hustler with, with um, uh, Jackie Gleason and what's that guy's name? Paul Newman. And, and they're the poo shooting hustlers. And, and Fast Eddie's is Paul Newman. And, and he's shooting against Fats Domino, which is Jackie Gleason, and Jackie Gleason is the, he's the champ. He's the best there is, you know. And, and Fast Daddy comes in there and tells Fats he's going to shoot pool. So he's shooting pool against that Minnesota Fats, and then the next thing you know, uh, Minnesota Fats is losing big that time. That movie's The Hustler, right? Yeah, The Hustler. And he's losing big time. And everybody that's in the pool room, they're like, oh, they're all astonished at that at Minnesota Fast losing. And so he goes in the bathroom and Jackie Gleason and he washes his hands. He washes his face, put that face on and stuff. And he puts himself all together and he's looking at himself in the mirror. And then he comes back out and everybody's like, ah, oh, he done, you know? So they see him, you know, it look like he done. And old Minnesota Fast put the hands out for the talcum powder and say, all right, Fast Daddy. Let's shoot some pool. <laughs> he goes off and beats Fast Eddie to death, take all the money and everything. You know, but that's the show. And in the end, Fast Daddy reciprocates and does it back to him. But that's what it is. He knew himself. This is what he used to keep himself going. This was the ploy. This is what the this was the 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 thing, his mantra, a mantra, whatever you call it. This is what he used when stress was to take him and he alleviated stress. He would he would just he used to wash his face and hands and, and say that. Colin Powell did the same thing. He used it from the movie. Colin Powell would go in there and he'd, uh, he, would, he, would, he would do it in his mind, washing his face and hands, but he'd always say, all right, Fast Eddie, let's shoot some poo. And he'd go in there and it doesn't matter what the situation is. He knew himself enough to know that he's not going to be persuaded by anybody else in the room Irregardless of what their position is on what he was going to do. And I think the only time he really once let himself down, and I'm not sure why he did that, was with the um, missiles in Iraq. He knew that there was stuff in there, but it was all used up. <laughs> it's like hard to prove it's there, but they used it all. So, well, anyway, folks, I want to thank everybody for tuning in and let me ramble at you. And in, a, in about a month, I'm going to be uh, introducing some, some nice membership cards and, and, and a nice, a nice uh, certificate for Archangels. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll start to look at how people can really identify and be Archangels within themselves and within their community and see other people in that same light and everything and how they can... Give this little reward and this little privilege to other people to be an archangel. So that'll be coming soon, folks, now that we got the values of being an archangel. Kind of in a way, we'll be addressing these all, all the way through. We're going to get into what it really takes to become an archangel. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. And I want everybody to have their fun and, and stay live and stay happy. And remember, you are you and you're special. So go and be special, people. <laughs> I'm special because I got a hat. You know, <laughs> that makes me special. Oh, I'm special without a hat. doesn't matter. I'm rambling.
So <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna tune it off now and I wanna thank everybody again for tuning in. I hope we had a good